Okay, a controversial Lower Decks episode we talk about next. Hello out there, I'm the Oldest Nerd, and uh, today the Lower Decks episode 7 from season 3 called A Mathematically Perfect Redemption, which is to say, uh, if you've seen any of Star Trek, you know that when something is mathematically perfect, it's not perfect. It is something that's missing the human element, and uh, despite that, this uh, has kind of a human element in it and not one of the better ones. And I think that's why a lot of people find this show not as enjoyable, certainly as last week when we had the uh, Deep Space Nine people, uh, a lot of good nostalgia. There's not much of that here. Uh, there are some themes that have gone through Star Trek over the years. Uh, for instance, uh, primitive societies, there doesn't ever seem to be any... I mean, in Enterprise, they did go back to 30s or so, and the um, uh, episode with Joan Collins in the original series, um, City on the Edge of Forever, uh, showed um, Earth in about 1930. But for the most part, uh, in alien worlds, we see them either uh, in a technological parody with the Federation or Stone Age. And uh, in this case, they kind of twist that a little bit. Uh, what we see is a very basic society, an avian society. Uh, they uh, call the planet Aeolius, uh, or, or something like that, because even the people on the Cerritos are having some difficulty uh, pronouncing the name of the planet. Uh, kind of a little dig in to uh, planetary names, I think. Uh, there is um, uh, a couple of new species. Uh, we see this uh, avian species, and uh, we also see the uh, Drukmani, which are a group of salvagers uh, that go after uh, some space junk that uh, apparently our main character in this episode, Peanut Hamper, is part of. Now, uh, if you remember Peanut Hamber, that is an exocomp which was introduced in the first season, who as soon as any trouble came on the Cerritos, beamed out and decided to take her chances elsewhere. And uh, we find her floating amongst debris at the beginning of this episode, which leads to uh, one of the things we have never seen in Lower Decks before, which is an alternate opening montage. Uh, it has always been the same, where the ship almost falls into a black hole and uh, uh, hits an asteroid and is um, attacked by some kind of uh, energy-consuming creature, uh, all for the three jokes that they want to put in the opening montage. But um, my opinion about these kind of jokes, generally speaking, is that once you've told it, the joke is told, uh, move on to something else. And uh, that's the problem of putting a joke in the opening montage, in my opinion. Be that as it may, this particular opening montage shows uh, just the credits as they open up the story, something very different for a very different kind of story, one that for the majority of the episode does not even involve uh, most of the crew, crew of the Cerritos. Uh, it all centers around a one-off character, which is uh, kind of unusual in track. Uh, there is some callback to... Um, Avatar, and uh, also uh, a pretty direct um, tribute to Castaway with Tom Hanks. You remember that, where he anthropomorphizes this uh, volleyball, or is it a soccer ball? It's a soccer ball. And in this case, uh, it is something else that is made to look like kind of an exocomp, and uh, that keeps um, uh, Peanut company until she's able to uh, uh, fashion a way to get away from the debris field and uh, onto a planet which uh, is a bird planet. Now, uh, uh, not uh, uh, the, the birds are kind of humanoid birds, uh, but uh, everything flies. Uh, they have some goats that fly and pigs that fly and the obvious joke that goes along with that when pigs fly. So uh, this is uh, the way it is, uh, it is set up. And it looks for uh, all of this to be kind of a redemption story and, uh, and to show that uh, there is something uh, good about 
living life forms that that should uh, be able to uh, uh, exist and uh, and and we see uh, a change in the nature of uh, peanut hamper um, without giving anything away um, that's where the disappointment begins uh, in the this characterization and how they eventually end up uh, I have a little problem with this society that is uh, completely without technology and then suddenly has some. Uh, I am uh, uh, I have a problem with some of the scenes that are cringeworthy and apparently intentionally cringeworthy. And and also, uh, but there's one good thing at the end that I kind of like, and uh, they cut to. Uh, a uh, an epilogue where they show a number of uh, megalomaniacal machines. Now uh, we have seen this all through the series, uh, from the original series on through. That um, there is something that is special about humanity. That was the um, contrast that was drawn between Spock and Kirk. In that Spock was very orderly in his way of thinking, very logical, and yet it was usually the human element that he lacked that made Kirk a great commander. And uh, they've done it in other ways with machines. For instance, uh, the M5, uh, the ultimate computer, I believe is what they called it uh, in the original series, where uh, the, uh, the, the computer becomes kind of power mad. Uh, then uh, there's also other places where there is a computer that is uh, leading a simple society like uh, Vol or uh, Landru, uh, places like this that, that shows this lack of humanity is uh, problematic. And uh, so in the last scene, you see a representation of all these machines that have been put away in some kind of uh, Federation lockup. And um, one in, you might notice, if you look that over again, one of them has a CBS logo on it. So uh, they're taking a dig at their own paycheck there. But uh, I think that was probably the takeaway from this episode. I'd like to know what you think about this. Uh, uh, what do you think about the new species they introduced, the Drukmani, and, uh, and of course this avian species? And uh, uh, do we think that we're going to see uh, more um, adventures with Peanut Hamper and uh, perhaps uh, uh, following on to um, uh, other related kind of things? It seems that uh, the show is becoming its... Um, uh, creating its own lore and and now uh, hearkening back to some of that and uh, that shows that uh, this is uh, this is here to stay I'd like to know what you think about this please subscribe to the channel and uh, among other things we'll be talking about uh, uh, some things that have been uh, shared with us from the New York Comic Con. Uh, for instance, uh, we know that uh, Star Trek Picard, uh, when it comes back, is uh, going to have uh, um, a couple of ships, actually uh, a variety of ships. They're going to use the Titan, uh, but they're also going to uh, have the Stargazer and there will be other uh, ships of various eras uh, represented in that, uh, in that series, that uh, season. And uh, they're not promising that all of the Next Generation crew who have joined Picard uh, for this season are going to live all the way through it. So uh, that is uh, something there that might be of interest. Also uh, revealed at Comic-Con is uh, from Star Trek Discovery that uh, Saru will uh, continue to... Um, have a relationship with the president of Nevar, and uh, that should be interesting. We don't know if uh, Book and um, and uh, Burnham are going to get back together, but I would suspect that they are. There may be something of a central theme uh, there, a subplot, if you will. They also said that Discovery is going to head more in the direction of, uh, of the other series that, uh, that have been more popular. So uh, we'll see how they evolve in this season as it comes up. Um, so uh, let me know what you think by putting it all below and uh, ring the bell if you haven't done so to uh, know when the next video is coming your way. So uh, until next time, don't go far.